Let's talk about credibility. The short definition of credibility is believability. Whether or not you should accept or believe the statements or claims of a person or a source of information. A longer definition is the following. A statement is credible if and only if belief in it is warranted. Now remember that IFF isn't a typo. IFF is a shorthand for if and only if. So another way to make that statement is if a statement is credible, then belief in it is warranted. And if belief in it is warranted, then a statement is credible. What it means to be warranted is that we have compelling reason or reasons to believe. So usually we check the statement or source or person, person's credentials. We check what that person is saying with what we know and what we have experienced. So usually a statement is credible when it jibes with, when it's consistent with our background information. So background information is our prior knowledge and experience. We should also consider whether or not the source or statement is initially plausible. Not everything that is not initially plausible is not credible. Okay, that was probably too many negatives. In other words, sometime, sometimes something sounds nuts or sounds wrong when you first hear it, but it turns out to be true. But when something sounds funny, that's definitely an indication, an indicator that skepticism is warranted. Remember Wittgenstein's rope, what we covered the first week of class. It didn't seem initially plausible that the rope, just adding 10 feet, would make it nearly up, um, over a foot and a half off the surface of the earth. But when we did the math, we turned out that that was correct. People are credible when they have a history of making credible statements. I mean, think about when you trust somebody. It's usually because you've known them for a long time and you know them to not be a liar or you know them to be an honest person. Maybe not every single time, but for the vast majority of the time. You think about the boy who cried wolf. That's a classic story where somebody loses credibility to the detriment of their life. Okay, let's talk about our sources now. Sources of information. Where do we get our information? Well, one of the main sources of information is actually ourselves. What we perceive, experience, our direct observation, our memories, etc. That's where we get a lot of our information. Now, of course, we're going to talk about newspapers and websites and other people. But most of the information in our life comes through our five senses. So let's ask ourselves, what can interfere with our own credibility? What can distort our experience, observation, perceptions, and our memory? Well, let's split this category into two and start with internal factors. Biasy, stress, fatigue, exhaustion, all can impact our experience. So could drugs, even societal and peer pressures. Consider someone that is a witness in a jury trial. Say there was some bad automobile accident and there was a fatality. Think of the things that could affect the credibility of the eyewitness. Maybe some of the people involved were people of color and the person, the eyewitness, was prejudiced against them. So their internal biases can affect their statements about the event. Whether or not someone stressed or tired can affect their credibility as well. When you're really exhausted, you might not remember things in the same way as when you're feeling fine. And of course, any sort of intoxication can affect our perception. And of course, peer and 
societal pressures play an important role. You can be coerced into doing or saying something, and sometimes it's less subtle. Okay, let's talk about external factors. Think about, imagine you're the eyewitness of an accident. What could impede your own observation of the event? Well, things that inhibit our ability to see properly, certainly. So, maybe it's dark or cloudy, it was foggy. Maybe the accident caused a lot of noise and there were distractions. Think about jury trials. When you're called to the stand, it might be weeks or months after the event. And I, all that, when all that time passes, we tend to forget. And it's been psychologically shown that we tend to recreate events. And we, um, to the point where we even believe the new creation to be reality when it's just not the case. Or maybe the person wasn't wearing their glasses or contacts, etc. All right, second source, other people. So this includes our friends, family, coworkers, peers, strangers, etc. What do you think the most important thing is when you're judging the credibility of other people? Well, going back to the boy who cried wolf story, it's going to be things like reputation and past accuracy. How honest have they been in the past? And how often and how close are they to getting things right? Also, we need to take into account the person's expertise in the relevant field. How knowledgeable are they on the subject? So, if the person is talking about philosophy, and they have a degree in philosophy, well, that makes them credible. If they're talking about philosophy, and they're just some random person on the street, then they don't have the same credentials. Notice that the word credentials is related to credibility. Also, as a logical thinker and a critical thinker, we should be aware of sources. Don't just believe someone because they say it as if it were true. Or they say it emphatically. They say it with emotion. Don't be afraid to question them. Or ask them, um, where did you hear that? Or, um, are you sure? What was your source? A lot of people will say, well, I heard that so-so, or I read somewhere, but they won't actually cite their specific source. That's when you should be skeptical. Okay, let's ask ourselves which of these are credible statements. Now, I'm not necessarily going to have the answer for you, but think about, think about what the immediate answer might be. Some of these are going to be urban legends, myths, and just outright falsehoods. Some of them will be true. But the key during this exercise will be to ask yourself, do I really know the answer to this question? Or is research called for? Okay, let's go through... Um, some of these on the list. Obama is Muslim. Obama has been charged with being a Muslim ever since he has took politi he's taken political office. But that's just false. Obama is a devout Christian. Or that he's not a U.S. citizen. So conspiracies are related to credibility. Rarely is a conspiracy theory credible. Now, it's not to say that they're always wrong, but we should always be very skeptical of them. People jump on the bandwagon. They think it's exciting to think that it's possible that a U.S. president isn't actually a U.S. citizen. And this is where biases that we talked about in one of the prior slides enter, in as, enter the equation. Did people think that Obama wasn't a Muslim? I mean, wasn't a U.S. citizen? because they actually had good evidence, or did part of their prejudices against African Americans have an impact on their judgment? Here's another conspiracy theory, that we never landed on the moon. People, people at the time suggested that it was a giant hoax, and that the moon, quote unquote, was really just a Hollywood set. And I'll talk about how the flag is waving and there's not wind on the, um, in the atmosphere of the moon and things like that. 
But again, I think that there's a little bit of wishful thinking. It would be so excite um, cover ups and conspiracies are exciting, and it um, it's it, it sells papers, right? And it's uh, you know it's an interesting story to pass along. This is a myth. Sucking on a penny can help you beat a breathalyzer test. So there's a show that many of you are probably familiar with called Myth Mythbusters, and they busted this myth. But some of you, before I talked about this, might have thought, yeah, that that's true. Here's another conspiracy. 9-11 was not the result of terrorists, but was planned by the U.S. government. There is a, um, a documentary about this called Loose Change, where the filmmaker suggests that it was a setup by the Bush administration. Now they start with some of the, uh, the premise that there were a lot of unanswered questions and that's why it's called loose change. But just because there are unanswered questions doesn't mean that there is some sort of cover-up. When there are gaps in the information, it's human nature to fill them in and sometimes we fill them in by appealing to our wild imaginations, but we have to be careful. Here's some more. The Kennedy assassination was a hoax. That's also a very popular, very famous alleged conspiracy theory. Um, if you just Google the magic bullet, you'll get all sorts of info on that. Most Muslims are Arabs. Now, most of you out there probably would think that this is a credible statement. But it's my understanding that this isn't true. And feel free to do your own research on this. But I think the majority of Muslims live outside the Arab world. They actually live in places like Southeast Asia and Africa. There was a story about Lady Gaga, that she was a hermaphrodite. But again, did this, become, did, did this spread all over the internet because it was true? Or because people thought it was fascinating gossip? And it was interesting. And um, people wanted to tweet about it and Facebook about it, etc. Here was a story about Richard Gere, that he did something, and I won't explicitly say what it is, but something very bad with a gerbil, right? How many of you believe that until right now? And now how many of you are questioning it? It rarely hurts to question something. What about... Um, the fake sugar that's in drinks like Diet Coke. Does that give you cancer? A lot of people say so, but is that really credible? So this chapter ties in to a section that we're gonna discuss when we investigate induction. That's related to causal arguments and scientific reasoning. So a lot of times you shouldn't just trust your friend or someone that you talk to. To know if something like Diet Coke gives you cancer, you'd have to go and uh, talk to an expert or read um, some sort of credible source or you would have to establish this experimentally right and I think one of the lessons of this uh, section of the class is that it's okay to say I don't know right I don't know if Diet Coke I'll even say right now I don't know if Diet Coke gives you cancer I know a lot of people believe that but um, I, I usually hold off on accepting claims like that until I've heard about them in some reputable news source or looked at some scientific journal. Here's some more. Cell phones cause cancer. Is that true? I'm just going to say I don't know. Um, I remember hearing one uh, doctor, Dr. Dina Doe, who has been an on-air doctor personality for a long time. He pointed out something interesting that um, if cell phones cause cancer, then you, we would likely see an uptick in the data on cancer uh, of, the, of the head and near the ear there. But since we haven't seen that, it's unlikely that cell phones cause cancer. Now again, I'm not, giving, I'm not saying that it does or it doesn't, but I'm saying a lot of times um, what we should do is look it up for yourself. Double check sources. Doesn't hurt. Napoleon is really short. Is that a fact of history? Why don't you look it up? It's my understanding that Napoleon was a little bit shorter than average, but he wasn't, you know, like five feet tall. 
and that one of the reasons why people believed he was so tall or so short is because um, his height was given in French measurements, was a, which was a little bit different than what we're used to. And if you do the conversion, then he was a little bit shorter than average, but not terribly short. But again, I don't know. I, I just um, when I did some research for these slides, I was looking up myths, and that's one of the one I came up upon. But maybe it's wrong, so look it up for yourself. Can you see the Great Wall of China from the moon? A lot of people say that. Again, maybe you believe that, maybe you shouldn't. Look it up for yourself. If you replace the sun with a black hole of the same mass, the Earth would be sucked in by extreme gravity. I think the, I, most people think of black holes as like a giant vacuum that sucks things in. But I don't know if they really do this with things with matter. You know, it might be that they just suck up light or that light can't escape. Um, things like that. Okay, here's some more. Have you ever heard that during the spring equinox, it's easier to balance an egg on its end because of the way the, the gravity and the tilt of the earth? Is that credible? I have no idea. Here's another common belief, that drinking soda dehydrates you. Is that true? Is that credible? Maybe, maybe not. Climate change. A lot of people think that it's just a big conspiracy. But with climate change, certainly it's better safe than, be, than to be sorry. Better safe than sorry. If there is even a chance that it's real, then we should take action to combat it. At one point, if you said that the earth was round, no one thought that you were right. People only use 10% of their brain. This might be another myth. Now, it might be that people only use 10% of a brain at, the to at one time, or they only use 10% for cognition, and then other parts of the brain are doing other things like regulating the heart and our autonomic nervous system, etc. But this, again, might be a big myth. Does cracking your knuckles cause arthritis? Are vaccines bad for you? Do they contain mercury? Do they cause autism? A lot of people claim that, but is that credible? So some of these might be fodder for the paper that you're going to have to write in this class. You could research this issue and give an argument for or against uh, any one of these. Does reading in dim light, is that bad for your eyes? You could do some research and find out. Should you not awaken, sleep, awaken sleepwalkers? Is the apocalypse here? Shows like The Walking Dead certainly would have us believe so, or um, numerous preachers that have made predictions. The world was supposed to end in December of 2012, but it didn't. People believe that, but it turned out that was incredible. Is there mostly oxygen? Now this one I know the answer to. It's actually not. It's mostly nitrogen. I've heard um, that, that daddy long legs are considered to be some of the most poisonous in the world, but their mouths are too small to bite. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not. People talk about evolution not being a credible theory. Here are some more. So I'll let you, uh, we've gone over enough, enough of these, so I'll let you read them on your own. Okay, let's move on to the next source of information, which is related to all of those um, claims, uh, questionable claims, and that's experts. When you want to find out if daddy long legs are really poisonous or about black holes, sometimes we can't figure it out by talking to our peers and our friends. We need the help of an expert. So an expert, for example, could be a scientist, a teacher, professor, doctor, etc. So what makes an expert an expert? You probably can answer this without just waiting for the next bullet point. It's exactly what you would think makes an expert an expert. It's their education and experience. That, those are the two most important things. Some combination of. Other things that can bolster expertise are reputation among peers, their accomplishments. Also related to expertise are studies, research, experiments, the scientific method. Remember you learned this in junior high school in your science class? When you make an observation, you form a hypothesis, and then you test that hypothesis to either confirm or disconfirm it, and then you repeat the process. That's how we figure out things about like black holes and daddy long legs. So scientists employ the scientific method. 
and they publish their results in what are called peer-reviewed journals. Now, this is a really important distinction from other sources of media. If it's peer-reviewed, that means that other experts in the field have checked up on the research and they endorse it, or at least they'll say that they have no qualms with it. Another thing to note is that these sorts of journals, they're not out for profit. And so people publish in them just to kind of um, forward the pursuit of science. And it's not about money at all. So when something's a really tough issue, like climate change, sometimes you have to look at what is the common agreement. Maybe there's not consensus, but what do most of the articles and most of the experts that are publishing in the peer-reviewed journals, what are they saying? So a lot of people that are against climate change, maybe conservative politicians, they might cite some, uh, you know, one paper in some journal that says that climate change isn't real. Now, um, that may be, but if the overwhelming majority of articles claim that climate change is real, then that's the side that is the better side to be on. Okay, let's talk about the media now, the fourth source of information. So the media, media is plural. The singular form of media is medium. When you think of medium, you think of in between two extremes, right? Like medium salsa, spiciness is in between hot and cold. Well, the media, every single medium is in between two things, the source, and the person that is getting the information from the source. So in this case, ourselves and the source, which could be an event or it could be the black hole or the daddy long legs or the climate itself. And so what connects us with the facts are all sorts of things. The web is probably the, the source of information that most people today go to first. But nonfiction books count, so do certain novels textbooks, encyclopedias, academic journals like the peer-reviewed ones that we just discussed, magazines, newspapers, television, radio, the list goes on. One thing to note or one thing to think about when you are trying to figure out if a source is credible or not is what the interests are of the people that advance or put, soar, put forward or publish the source. What are their motives? What are their interests? Now, a lot of times there is a conflict. Think about news organizations, for example. What is their primary goal? Well, it's usually a give and take between two things. Number one, a news organization wants to present their audience with the most objective, in other words, unbiased or neutral, rhetoric-free, perspective. They want to convey the facts, right? Right. Otherwise, it's not news, right? It's a tabloid. But of course, for a lot of news organizations, they simultaneously want to maximize profit. A lot of these organizations are for-profit businesses, and they make a profit by conveying information. But the problem is, if, if, um, if a newspaper just presents a list of facts, it might be boring. And the reader is going to buy the paper that spins the information or sensationalize it or editorialize it. Or the presentation of it is really flashy. Think about the local news media. Think about how flashy the graphics are. Think about the anchors, um, how they pick attractive people and they have professional people doing the lights and the makeup, and they have dramatic music, and it's supposed to catch your eye. All of that is intentional so that you don't change the channel and go to the competitors. But all of that switches us from the neutral facts, from the, lo from the logos, down into the pathos. And we have to, just knowing that is important, and it's just a fact of our psychology that we are affected by those sorts of things. So being aware of that can help you not be so effective. It's not necessarily bad that we're affected by it, but being aware of it is good. So 
news is rarely just straight news. You know, it's not like um, you know, it's a list of facts. Today was Wednesday. It was 72 degrees. There were, um, you know, if it's a political season, there were X amount of speeches done by so-and-so politicians and X so-and-so bills passed and the Supreme Court did blah 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 right? It's often written in a way that is supposed to be compelling and gripping. So news, the, 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 the line between news and entertainment can be a fine line. Now some people blame the stories that become too much entertainment on big evil corporations' faults. Now it might be true that a lot of times these organizations, and some people say, oh, there's there, you know, freedom of the press is really just a sham because there's only one or two giant media conglomerates and they control everything and they have these motives and so on and so forth. Now, there, um, there are news sources that are not for profit, right? Like um, PBS and NPR are examples, but those are changing of late as well. So it might be true that these organizations are pandering, which means that they're kind of gratifying or indulging human Im impulses that we almost can't help from acting on because they're str so strong or that we're unaware of them. And so that's us, for example, being affected by the, um, the graphics or the music or the attractive anchors or the, um, the pictures that come along with the newspaper or the color. Newspapers used to all be in black and white, but they start putting them in color because it was more compelling. But if we just blame the big evil corporation, we might be missing out on some personal responsibility. The CEOs, they might say, hey, we don't have a gun in anyone's head. We're not forcing people to buy papers or to tune in. We're just giving the consumers what they demand. So part of the reason why our news is so mixed with entertainment is because that's what sells and that's what we're buying, right? So it's both people are responsible, the companies and the person. Now, I can't tell you what the split is. If it's 50-50 or 70-30, that's a decision that you're going to have to kind of make on your own. But just being aware that both contribute to this issue and to this, it is a problem, that's what's important. I mean, let's say that you're a CEO of a news organization. And let's say you want to be objective and unbiased and impartial and you don't want to have the flashy graphics and the sexy anchors, etc. You just want to give the straight news. But then what might happen is you might start losing ratings, right? What if there's a, comp a competing news program that has the exact same content, right? They're talking about all of the same um, stories, but your competition has the sexy anchors, the fa flashy animation, the graphics, the dramatic music. Which do you think is going to get the ratings? And whose fault is that, right? Think about Las Vegas. Las Vegas is the epitome of pandering. All of the things that, um, all of the tactics and psychological methodology that's being employed in Vegas, it's very effective, right? The lights, the glitz, and the things that they're selling, it's all about inf uh, instant gratification, sex, money, alcohol, pleasure, right? Instant gratification. And so we just have to be aware that we are just naturally drawn to these things and it might take some discipline and some personal responsibility. So I think both parties are to blame. So a lot of times um, people charge some of the um, news organizations that lean left or, or lean right. Fox News is often charged with leaning right. MSNBC is charged with leaning left. And they're charged with spinning the stories or editorializing or sensationalizing them. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about are advertisements. And I might have mentioned this a little bit in some other lectures. So we talked about the logos pathos distinction, which goes back to Aristotle. There's a part of our psychology that responds to logic and argumentation. And there's another part that responds to things that... Um, have an emotional component to them. And both can be really, really powerful. But it turns out in terms of advertising, 
this is a little bit surprising, but it's not argumentation that can be the most effective means of getting you to endorse or to purchase or patronize a product or a company. It's probably the pathos advertisements. Okay, so the Logos, Logos ones are reason giving. They give you an argument to buy a product. And an example of those are usually new prescription drugs that come on the market. They usually will say, you should take our drug if you have these symptoms because they will make your pain and your bad symptoms go away. And or they will make them go away faster than our competitor's product. So that's a reason giving ad. But most ads, maybe I shouldn't say most, but a lot, and certainly the ones that are the most effective and arguably the, the mo uh, um, that are the most expensive and arguably the most effective are non-reason. And these appeal to the, emoti the emotive or the effective with an A, the emotional part of our psychology. They often appeal to basic human desires and preferences. They have this strong psychological force and not particularly strong logical force. And I submit as evidence that these non-reason giving pathos ads are the most effective is because if you look at most Super Bowl ads, these are the most expensive. The rate, I believe, of a Super Bowl ad is $8 million per minute. So if you're going to spend $8 million for a one-minute ad in the Super Bowl, obviously you're going to do your homework and figure out what's going to be the most effective. And since most of the ads are non-reason giving or appeal to pathos, then it stands to reason that they are the most effective if you're going to spend that much money. And they do. They spend money not just on the ad, but they spend lots of money on research, figuring out, making several ads and which one's the most effective. And they do market research and they have, um, they have samples of people and they, they do a um, focus group, so that's what they're called. They'll find a small group of people that's supposed to represent the average Americans and see what they like and see what kind of things will be effective for them. Okay, so that's the end of our talk on credibility.